Welcome back, everyone. Next up, we have Gold Source Mines, Inc. It trades on the OTCQX under the symbol GXSFF and on the TSXV under the symbol GXS and is a Canadian exploration company focused on the 100% owned Eagle Mountain Gold project in Guyana, South America. Presenting today will be the CEO, Steve Parsons. Steve is a mining-focused professional with over 25 years in the industry. He returned to the corporate side after spending 15 years working for Canadian banks and investment dealers out of Toronto. Steve joined Gold Source as CEO in November 2020, joining a team of well-known industry professionals. Now, this is going to be an interesting presentation for those of you who don't know much about Guyana, like myself. It's a well-known country for gold, but you might not know that it's one of the fastest growing economies in the world on a GDP basis. Economically and geopolitically, Guyana is on a very different trajectory to most of South America. So let's see what this means for mining in Guyana and gold source specifically. Steve, welcome to the Emerging Growth Conference. We're so excited to have you and learn and hear your presentation. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. And, and Anna, thanks for the introduction and, and thank you to the Emerging Growth Conference for including Gold Source in today's high quality lineup. So the goal here today for us is, is to introduce many new investors to Gold Source, make it clear that there exists tangible opportunities to surface significant value at the company level. And as, as Anna indicated, introduce you to Guyana. Guyana is a country that should be on your radar screens. It's not just favorable for gold geology, but the country's economic trajectory will bring to bear many opportunities going forward. So, so watch for that. We will be having forward-looking statements as it relates to several as aspects of the project and the company. The information is also on our, on our website for review if you'd like to review it later. So who are we? We are a management team that has an express focus on multi-million ounce gold deposits. Importantly, we have a precondition that the asset must cater to scalability. That is the ability to scale into the scale into the capex, scale into the production, and and both those two things have a proven ability to manage overall execution risk for project delivery. So very important for us, as Anna said, we are a single asset advanced stage explorer. We not we are not proof of concept. We have a large gold uh, gold resource already in Guyana. We are focusing on the 100% owned Eagle Mountain Gold project in Guyana, South America. Um, the project is, is quite large. As I mentioned, it hosts 1.8 million ounces of gold contained in the indicated and inferred categories. There is runway for that resource to grow further along two key structural trends. We've got a north-south, then we have a northeast trend, which we'll get into. Uh, and importantly, there's features of the project that do indeed cater to scalability, okay? So there's three points are here noted on the slide. The first is that Eagle Mountain is shallow. It's very shallow. Gold starts at surface. It's laterally extensive, about two and a half kilometers, kilometer and a half wide in one spot. And the indicated resources, which is the higher confidence category, uh, the resources there have an av average depth of only 35 meters in the Eagle Mountain deposit, so very shallow. Secondly, about 500,000 ounces are hosted in the very weathered saprolite. Saprolite is essentially weathered rock, gold that's been, uh, rock that's been weathered in situ. The gold is, is in situ here. The photograph um, tells the story. This is very soft, it's free digging. And in mining terms, free digging means no drilling, no blasting. You dig it with an excavator and you direct it to a low power intensity processing plant that can offer significant capex and opex benefits, okay? so. Key point there. The last point is the deposit is flat lying. It's at surface. We've got stacked mineralized horizons. Essentially, we start mining right at surface. And with that, when you have a, a horizontal deposit, you can cherry pick and mine your high grades first without sterilizing your deposit. And when you mine the high grades first, you, you bring forward the higher margin material. And that's obviously better for a cash flow model and better for valuation. So we'll be able to reflect that into the PFS when that comes out first half of next year. So based on these characteristics, what we're looking at is a phase development plan where we start in the saprolite for a number of years as our baseline production, low capex baseline production, and we generate sort of multi years of operation in the saprolite. And then we use those cash flow to build out the larger yet still shallow conventional fresh rock operation that just sits below this. On the next slide. So Eagle Mountain. 
Um, as mentioned, we are located in, in Guyana. Guyana is situated in, in South America, but I would say culturally it is closer to the Caribbean in many respects. English is the official language. The laws are based on British standards. There's tax treaties with Canada, the UK, the CARICOM states. In fact, the administrative office of CARICOM is based in Georgetown. So very sort of Caribbean in, in culture. Geologically, Guyana here is very similar and essentially the Western extension of what you see in West Africa. West Africa, obviously very well known for gold with some huge gold deposits, obviously some, some big deposits in the Guyana Shield as well, including Guyana, but it is generally the pace of exploration has been slower for a couple of reasons. There's one, there's less infrastructure and two, it's, it's under typically heavy vegetation. So Nevertheless, Guyana is a gold country. There's been some large deposits there. And with that has come a pedigree for mining. Okay, the, the, this pedigree is important to us as a company. It's embedded in the mining code, the knowledge and the fluency of the agencies when it comes to mining and in the skill of the workers, principally that that skill is shallow open pits, which suits us well because we have, we have a shallow deposit. Um, our project is 230 kilometers southwest of the capital, Georgetown, which is here. We're in central Guyana. More specifically, we're seven kilometers south of a town called Madia. Madia has 3,500 people. It's the capital of Region 8. It offers um, significant services, hospitals, schools, mechanic shops. Uh, there's a commercial airport there, which we use. And importantly, it's road accessible from Georgetown, which was a factor in, in, in us selecting this project many years ago. So despite the prospective geology of Guyana, I, I would say one of the main knocks on the country when it comes to mining has been the lack of infrastructure. And this has slowed the pace of discoveries relative to West Africa. It's added to development costs in the past. And I say in the past because this is changing very quickly. The infrastructure build out is underway. It is happening with pace, perhaps faster than most people in this industry recognize. And the reason for this, the company became an oil and gas producer in late 2019. Uh, this has come with sizable foreign investment. The, the foreign investment is being directed to large infrastructure projects, including major roads, uh, power projects, for example. You can see in this slide where we're situated here with the Gamelt project, um, we are road accessible already. Mainly, it's, it's, it's a dirt road. It's paved from Georgetown to Linden, about 109 kilometers. This stretch of the road has been approved for upgrade 121 kilometers. That is $191.92 million, principally a foreign investment to upgrade that. Um, that project has kicked off and is expected to be done, whether it's, it's a little bit late, maybe it's 2025 now, but nevertheless, that's gonna be paved road within now 40 kilometers of our project site. So important infrastructure projects happening there. On the power side, obviously power is very important for mining as well. There's two things happening. There's a major gas to shore project. That gas is coming from offshore from the big oil and gas wells that uh, are owned by Exxon. And they're putting three stages of 90 megawatt power and that's gonna be in and around uh, the coast at Georgetown. Now there's a hydropower project that is, that is now planned. Initially it was proposed up to last year. Now it's planned. China Railway Group is selected for construction. They're still in some negotiations there with respect to financing, but that's gonna push power into the grid at about eight cents a kilowatt hour. And the expectation is for that to start moving ahead in the very near term. Initially, they wanted that to be substantially complete by 2027 with transmission lines, you know, coming the years after. So that's a very near term project as well. So, you know, that knock on Guyana is having a lack of infrastructure will be addressed here in the next couple of years. And, and in fact, obviously with that infrastructure that will bode well for the significant and large money projects that will happen in the country. So with respect to gold, both regionally and at the project level, uh, gold is widespread in the area. Regionally, we are here in an area, as I said, in around region eight. Madia is, is the town here, just about seven kilometers north of us. And what we're looking at here is, is concentric circles of 20 kilometers, 30 kilometers, and 50 kilometers with a couple significant mines just, just outside of us and around between 40 to 50 kilometers away. We're this green box here, 5,000 hectares, and size, the red dots around us represent gold showings in alluvials and in saprolite. So principally to the north of us, but clearly gold showings all around our prospecting license. Looking at the figure on the right-hand side, this is sort of the western side of our property here. 
These are the two structural trends I referred to earlier with the resources and, and targets along both. The, the 1.8 million ounces sit in here, principally in the Eagle Mountain deposit, and then up in and around Sabora here as well. So in all, we've got about seven kilometers here of uh, gold occurrences on these two structural trends. Satellite image of what we're looking at here, this in yellow, this is our prospecting license. And again, this is, this is the real deal here, uh, not just a proof of concept expiration story. We've got large resources already, and we have very significant artisanal mining happening all around us, uh, as I said, principally to the north. In fact, there's, there's kind of super artisanals here just off our northeast corner in an area called Tiger Creek. And you can see this is the size of operation they're looking at just off our northeast corner. So take a look at the snapshot of, of what's occurred for the last several years. There's been a series of discoveries um, in April, oh, sorry, in February of last year, we had our initial resource, uh, sort of that was a resource update that came in at 1.7 million ounces, half 50-50 between indicated and inferred. We had another resource update in April of this year where we converted a significant amount of the, the inferred to the indicated category. So now that was a 40% increase in indicated. So now we're sitting at 1.2 million ounces of indicated resources and another 582,000 ounces in the inferred category. Exploration and engineering is ongoing. Um, the plan there is, is for the, the April resource to provide the foundation for a pre-feasibility study that will be delivered in the first half of next year. So that's kind of how we we unlock value. And I think with respect to our project, given the satellite, which is free digging, soft rock, the shallow nature of our deposit, it, it's the pre-feasibility and the CapEx and the OpEx intensity that will really help contextualize the opportunity for investors is what does it mean with respect to the satellite and what does it mean with respect to CapEx and OpEx. So that'll be a big event for us. That'll be, that'll be mid next year, or sorry, that'll be the first half of next year. Looking at the resource, I won't spend too long on that. Already, I, I, I did speak to the overall size of the resource. I would say that it was based on 75,000 meters of drilling, so very substantially. Most of that most of that drilling was very shallow, only about 98 meters on average. So, so clearly, we, we've not really tested the depth, the depth potential here, but a lot of potential already within the top 100 meters. I will get to the other aspects that I referred to here. It's shallow and, and very favorable metallurgy. We're doing more tests now, which I'll speak to in a moment. So Eagle Mountain is a project defined by two deposits and two prospects right now. The two deposits, this is the Eagle Mountain deposit here, reflected in a larger sort of pink outline, and then a Salvor deposit slightly smaller here. What we've got is a, a, a large flat lying deposit within Eagle Mountain and then some vertical deposits along the north south corridor. Everything's been, um, stru well, everything is structurally controlled and everything's been affected by saprolytic weathering to depths of between 10 to 50 meters, depending on where you are in the, pod in, in the project. What I'll do first is look at the, the larger outline, which was the Eagle Mountain deposit. Um, that is about two and a half kilometers along strike, about a kilometer and a half wide. It is made up of a series or a system of, of horizontal or horizontal thrust faults within a granite diorite body. And you can see the shearing there where you've got this, this sort of shallow sub-horizontal stacked horizons, typically sort of from surface down to about 100 meters. And, um, and I said it's, it's, it's quite extensive along strike. And, and the saprolite would represent sort of in anywhere from the first sort of, on average, it's about 20, 17 to 20 meters of saprolite at surface. And the fresh rock just sits below that with a very narrow transition from the weathered saprolite into the very conventional sort of normal fresh rock that, you, that you'd see. In terms, of the, um, in terms of the indicated resource here, as I said, it's very shallow. About 75% of the indicated resource is within the first 50 meters of surface. So pretty shallow, probably compared to most other mining projects you look at. An example of what it looks like in practice here with the drilling, um, with these sub-horizontal zones, you can see as defined by our resource in the sort of the pink outlines. Uh, there are some very high grade areas of the Eagle Mountain deposit, we put some drill results out last year, which demonstrated this um, in an area called Ounce Hill, where you can see the results here. This was 34 meters true width from surface at about 20 grams per ton. So 
pretty fat interval of exceptionally high grade in the saprolite. So free digging 20 grams per ton is, is pretty compelling. And, and as we've done our mining studies, that looks like between Ounce Hill and an area called Zion, these are going to be the starter zones um, for the pit. Looking at an isometric of, of the Eagle Mountain deposit, you can see it's sort of a blanket of mineralization that's sort of draped across the side of a hill. 30% of the resource is saprolite. In fact, you can see the photo here on the right, it, the red represents the saprolite, so the weathered rock and the underlying fresh rock that sits below it, and the saprolite is about 30% of the overall resource. And again, low, 50, 17 meters on average locally up to 50 meters depth in some places. So along the north-south trend, as I said, we've got another deposit, slightly different. Um, we've got a deposit called a Salbora, Toucan, Powys, and, some, and some, some other prospects that we're looking at now. And they're typically vertical, sub-vertical, as you see in this figure here, where you've got um, the contact between the breccia structures along the north-south trend and the sub-horizontal zones that are coming from the Eagle Mountain deposit. And where the two interact, you typically get some localized high grades, as I'll show you in a bit. In total, you've got about 150,000 ounces in the Salbora deposit. It's about 60% higher grades. And again, very shallow, about 58% of the indicated resource at Salbora is within 50 meters of surface again. So we're looking at very shallow mineralization here. Uh, we should cater to very shallow open pits. Looking at the, the Eagle Mountain and the Salvador deposits in a sort of 3D image, you can see what our resource came back at. This was a pit constrained resource. We had, we had conceptual open pit shapes um, to define and help define and constrain that resource, uh, both for Eagle Mountain and Salbora. You can see that when we start looking at higher gold prices, no surprise, some of the deeper zones within the Eagle Mountain deposit, those deeper sub-horizontal horizons start coming into the picture within a pit constrained resource at a higher gold price. So we'll look to that in the future, but, but our, our base case resource was based on a $1,600 gold price. So for 2022, we've had uh, uh, several objectives. Um, we, are, we are sort of concurrent advancement on both exploration and engineering. Uh, in other words, with the exploration, exploration, what you're typically looking to do is surface value with new discoveries and on the engineering side, what you're typically looking to do is de-risk the project with engineering and technical studies. So we're working on both of that. At the same time, the, the Greenfields exploration side, in other words, looking at areas outside of the resource that we've currently got defined with Eagle Mount Sabora, we've done some, some basically reconnaissance work and some Greenfields testing some underexplored parts of the prospecting license. And really the aim is to to test these areas, we've seen very little work, partly because they're under, uh, under heavy vegetation cover, uh, with the aim of building out our resources. We've done some shallow drilling. What I can say is that for the first half of the year, that news has been pretty slow. Um, we didn't really identify many new areas and consequently the news has been, has been slow in that regard. Importantly, now we are starting to see some new areas which look very interesting to us. We'll know more in the next sort of several weeks to a month, but we are excited about some of the earlier stage stuff we're seeing now. Moreover, the drills are back working in the main part of the deposit along the north-south trend. We're drilling at the Toucan. We're drilling some, some additional targets within the Eagle Mountain deposit as well. So stay tuned for that. We'll have some both early stage exploration and some drill results coming up. With respect to Toucan, this is, is one of the areas on the north-south trend. It was one of our prospects. It was in the resource. However, it wasn't defined by many drill holes. We've, we just put another 10 holes into that. One of the holes... By example, one of the holes we put into this late last year and announced was 41 meters of 4.3 grams per ton from surface. Very high grade. That's where the, that's where the vertical breaches interact with the sub-horizontal granite diorites, and we see localized high grade. So we've got the 10 holes we just we just drilled there. About, about half of those are infill, half of those are step out. So those assays are pending, and, and we'll report back as the results are in. SOCA was a discovery that was announced in March of this year. It was not in the April resource. Uh, it is an area we need to circle back on. We will in the fourth quarter of this year. It had some very high grades, albeit at slight, slight depths, 130 meters vertical depth, six meters of 8.3 grams per ton, nine meters of 9.3 grams per ton, and 21 meters of 3.3. So an interesting area we need to circle back, and we will do that, as I said, in fourth quarter. So moving on from, from exploration onto engineering, 
you know, there's just a lot going on here. Typically, engineering is quiet. You don't hear a lot about it until the PFS is delivered. That being said, as we are working on some metallurgical work right now, we've got 850 kilogram sample in with SGS labs um, in Canada. We expect you should be in a position to release those results within the next month or so. That will be additional um, sort of recovery work, um, hardness testing on both the soft light and the soft rock. And we, we believe we should be in a position to demonstrate the high recovery, certainly within the saprolite, um, and demonstrate the soft nature of, of the saprolite and, and help investors contextualize what that could mean for CapEx in a low power intensity mill. Now I'm gonna move on from here. I, I touched on that, but essentially that's sort of a simple circuit configuration, what we're looking at. We've got some good, good teams involved with OMC, SGS, CSA, um, like a podium, all involved in, in some of the initial metallurgical work we're doing here. I mean, Guyana is a land of many waters and, and is rich in biodiversity. So therefore it's critical to complete dry and wet season surveys, biodiversity surveys. We've now done that twice, once in 2014 and again in 2021, both of which will feed into our permitting effort as we move the project forward post completion of the PFS. Timelines touched on this. Um, essentially, what we're looking to do is put out the pre-fees uh, first half of next year. That will be the foundation for that was the April 2020, 2022 uh, resource update. Uh, Guyana's pro mining fame, for, Guyana's, I guess I said the pedigree for mining in Guyana and their pro mining framework caters to an accelerated and relatively quick timelines for permitting relative to other jurisdictions. So you can see here, this would be the timeline we're looking at, but if we're treating everything sequentially, not parallel tracking anything, complete the PFS, start the application for, for, um, for permitting and the mining license, you know, we could look to get the saprolate into production potentially in the, in the 2025 timeframe, which for mining is relatively quick. So just in terms of the capital structure, we have got a tiny market cap, 18 million bucks uh, Canadian. We are not happy with that, of course. We do see tangible opportunities to unlock that value with the news coming out here through the end of the year. Importantly, we also have 4 million in cash. So that's sufficient through 2022 into 2023 to deliver on that, that drilling ends and some of the engineering studies. So net net with the market cap and the cash, we trade at US $7 an ounce with what we regard as executable ounces, given they're shallow, they're low strip, um, free digging in the saprolite, and in a country where you can get business done and get permitted relatively quickly. So, so I think this is a, it's a tremendous value here. Obviously there's a lot of gold exploration projects and gold development projects which have been hit very hard this year, given the trajectory of Guyana, the infrastructure improvements, some of the news we have on the come here through the balance of the year, you know, we, we do see their opportunities to, to unlock value and drive um, drive the valuation higher for investors. The team is built around, as, as Anna said, built around well-known industry professionals. Uh, we have a proven track record in exploration, discovery, mine development, specifically scaling projects from large to larger with multi-million ounce type discoveries. We do have expertise in the country. We've got a team of about 40 uh, made up of sort of technical and drilling staff in the country. And that certainly has allowed us to maintain productivities as we work through the program. So we touched on this already, but there is a plan for unlocking value. That plan starts and has worked throughout the year. We do see significant, uh, potentially significant news here through the balance of the year to start this process of driving a much more favorable valuation to reflect these shallow ounces that we do have and the opportunity we do have in Guyana. So Anna, I'll leave it there if there's any questions. <clears throat> Great job, Steve. Yeah, we do have some questions for you. Um, let's start. Uh, what do you anticipate the news flow to look like over the next several months? Yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's this interesting question because I mean, it probably stems from the fact that news flow for us has been very slow through the first half of the year. And, and that is that has impacted our valuation as well. It's it's obviously a market that's driven by by news and favorable news. In our cases, the news starts to pick up now. So we had some some expiration that occurred at the first half of the year, didn't deliver the results that we would have liked uh, on some new areas that were outside of our resource. We're now 
looking at some targets which look quite interesting, in fact. So we, we have the potential to start delivering news on that. We've got, in call it the next month or so, into November, we've got metallurgical results. As I said, that will come, I would suggest that would come in November timeframe as well, mid, mid fourth quarter. And then um, some drilling results. We had 10 holes into Toucan, which was one of the higher grade targets. And, and we'll have some, we have some assays pending on that as well. So a combination of exploration and, and some engineering stuff through the balance of the year. And then next year, the big, the big news will be the PFS. And that will help investors, as I said, contextualize some of the benefits of, of what we've got here with scaling into the operation and then, and then scaling it up over time. So overall, your drilling has been quite shallow, around 100 meters depth. So is there a potential at depth below the existing resources at Eagle Mountain and Salbora, for example? I mean, I mean, short answer, we think so. Um, these are orogenic gold systems. They tend to have deep roots. They tend to go deep. Um, we've not tested that. I mean, partly constrained by like a junior exploration company, part constrained by budgets partly constrained or guided by the fact that we've had a lot of success with shallow drilling. Um, we've got this laterally extensive deposit on like strike and, and laterally, and, and we've just continued to build that out and build out that resource and have had success with shallow drilling. So we haven't yet had to look deep, um, but there's, in our view, is certainly there's potential at depth. I would suggest that if this deposit was in the hands of a bigger company, they would have looked deep already. So Guyana, well, it doesn't seem to have the same issues hampering project timelines and developments as those being experienced in so many other South and Central American countries right now. That's that's a good thing. So is this being noticed by investors? How are you leveraging that? Yeah, great. I mean, great question. Um, I, I mean, correct. First of all, I'll say correct. That is true. It doesn't have the same issues affecting, you know, what we're seeing in South America, you know, pick your, pick your country, a lot of them with respect to permitting timelines have been slower, project delays, geopolitical issues. So we, I mean, Guyana is, is sort of viewed, I mean, viewed almost as the, the anti-Peru, the anti-Chile, the anti-Columbia right now. It's, it's sort of a destination for a lot of companies. I wouldn't say, I would say investors acknowledge it. They, they see that Guyana is better positioned in this regard. I wouldn't say it's reflected in valuations as of yet, certainly not our company. Um, I would suggest that if this really does become a destination for other mining companies, including those South American based miners who are looking to dilute some of the risk in their respective countries, if there's deals that start to happen in Guyana, then very quickly investors step in and, and while they're noticing already, they, they, I think they start, I mean, I think it starts to, to resonate more significantly once deals are done. So, Steve, you, you speak about scalability, perhaps a lot more than some of the other mining companies that presented our conferences. So I want you to explain why this is. What are the benefits? I do speak about this a lot. Um, you know, I, I just seen this a lot when I was an analyst for many years, um, working with Canadian banks and covering small companies, big companies through multiple cycles. And, and what's very clear in this industry, it is highly, highly procyclical. Everybody does everything at the same time. And, and this results in problems. And, and it's, it's, it's activities driven by metal prices. As metal prices go up, it's game on for everybody across, across the market cap spectrum. Small companies, big companies, everybody's drilling, assaying, getting engineering companies. Um, and not just gold companies, it's, it's base metal companies as well. So what, what happens is, is, is when gold's going up, it's probably because it's a weaker US dollar. It's driving all commodities higher, and whether it's gold companies or base metal companies, we're all pulling, pulling from the same small pool of consultants and engineering companies, and very quickly the industry gets congested hmm. um, to the point where timelines get missed, capex goes up, um, you're struggling to get people. I mean, some areas or some jurisdictions are more exposed to this than others, but generally, the bigger the project, the more exposed you are on all of these issues, and and. You know, and, and typically, you know, whether it's CapEx, whether it's timelines, whether it's overall pro project execution, bigger, bigger project, bigger regional infrastructure requirements, more exposed in this. So scalable for us is really important as smaller projects typically navigate these pressures better than the, the, the mega projects. 
and scalable projects navigate them even better. You can scale back, you can sort of tap into expertise that you wouldn't think would be available with a big project. So, and you've seen it time and time again, even sort of more recently in Africa, a lot of like bite size, reasonable size projects get built on time and on budget, even pro-cyclically when the, when it's, when the industry is very busy. Big projects, Quite the opposite. So, listen, scalable is really important to us. We focus, as I said, expressly focus on scalable projects, um, and Eagle Mountain is definitely one of them. We have a question from Ernst Sean Bachler. How do you compare to your peers in the country, like Oh My Gold and some others? They're different in that. Oh my was um, oh my was mined already. It was about 2.8 million or 3 million ounces were mined out of oh my. So, so the upper portion of oh my has been mined. So they're looking, they are looking at depth as an example. Whereas we're very much sort of a very shallow surface mining operation, um, new discovery in that sense, with still significant saprolite to be mined. So so different to oh my in that sense, but in and around the same market cap, I would say on the, on that side. And um, Dave Swanson asks, what do you anticipate your production costs to be at its current depth? Low, um, but this is something we, we, we're looking at right now. We're, as we go through the PFS, of course, this is, this is one of the, with respect to OPEX and CAPEX, total cash costs, all the sustaining costs, we'll be able to provide much better guidance once we go through the pre-feasibility study. The best we can do at this point is benchmark Eagle Mountain against what other sort of saprolite shallow operations are doing. And again, it's, 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 I mean, we, we've done that. We, we have not come out and provided guidance on that other than to say the saprolite will provide significant benefits to us. There's some, there's some similar mines. There's one called um, Bombore run by Orzone in Burkina Faso. There's another one, Mar Newmont's Marion mine in Suriname. It's significant saprolite operation. So these are the ones that I would suggest going out and looking at and seeing what they can do on an OPEX basis. And, and, uh, and we should be in and around those levels. Charlie wants to know if you anticipate cash flow to begin within the next 24 months. No, no, we, it, it would take for us, the pre fees would be, um, you know, again, we're targeting first half of next year. You, you need that document to start your permitting process. So, so permitting in Guyana, you need that, you need that economic study to start the process. And, and typically, you know, you could get, once you put the application in, it, it might be anywhere sort of 15 to 17 months from that point where you receive word on permits and then you start construction if you do everything sequentially. So again, I, I think 20, 2025 is kind of the time frame we're looking at. Jan Abbott uh, wants to know what sort of valuation jump would you expect when you announce proven reserves? Proven reserves would come with the pre-fees. And I think it's the combination of, of the reserves and the and the capex, the low capex intensity, and of course the from all that, the implied net present value of the project and the economics of the project that came out of this. So that would all come with the with the pre-fees. And and I mean, I haven't looked at where development companies are trading now, but everybody's been beaten up pretty bad. But I would say you know, multiples of, of where we're currently trading. Will says, given the risk at the current valuation, at which milestone would you consider an investment in the company today de-risked? What hurdles should I look for and what is the time frame? Well, I mean, I'm, I've been investing, um, <laughs> you know, all along here. Um, I guess the last significant investment I made uh, along with some of the management team was on the last private placement we did. So there was significant insider buying on, on, on that. So you know, we, we were very happy with what we saw in the project at that time. Um, that was prior to the last resource update where we, where we, we upgraded a lot more of the inferred to the indicated category. So, so that's, it's, it's, a, it's a tough market out there for, for gold stocks, but listen, the, we, we've got sufficient visibility on the size of our resource, what's happening in Guyana with respect to the infrastructure build out, there's, there's enough. Uh, it's really just comes down to the gold price. If the trajectory of gold moves higher, sustainably higher, um, you know, perhaps with less volatility, I, I think that's enough for a lot of investors to, to come down cap and look at a project like ours. 
Last question for you, Steve, from Bruce Stewart. What does drilling at an increased depth, if you choose to do that, do to production costs and the quality of the metal? Uh, we drill at about, we've got a contractor rig and we've got a rowing rig and it's typically about, for our rig, it's about 80 bucks US a meter. That wouldn't change from our, that's our, so our operational cost right now, our expiration costs, right? So, so we're really just going deeper on the holes, uh, maybe incrementally higher costs. Um, for us, the contractor rig is, is slightly higher than that. Um, so really, it's it's really just time. It times takes to, to go deeper and some additional costs. Um, and, and really, it's more of the risk is, is you want to make sure that you, if you're targeting deeper drilling, is, is you're targeting an area which has a higher probability of hitting the alteration, the structure, and the gold. So, so we need, still need to do some work on, on that. But it, it, it doesn't add a lot to, to OPEX, just an opportunity cost is you're drilling at depth as opposed to maybe drilling a shallow area, which you may know have my, a better chance of hitting shallow gold mineralization, maybe lower grade, but it's there. Well, Steve, this has been a fascinating presentation. We've learned a lot. Thank you so much. I would love it if you come back in the future. Give us these updates about what's happening in Guyana. You bet. Thanks, Anna. All right. Thanks for joining us. Okay, everyone, stay with us. We'll be right back with our last presenter.